The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guests joining me here today to deep dive into Oxford Risk include someone who started her working career in the Australian financial services world, however, went all the way over to the UK, including a stint working in the London Fire Brigade, would you believe? She then provided advice to high net wealth clients in the UK before shifting into the fintech space. Our other guest will be the first PhD from Cambridge we've had on the show, very exciting, and runs behavioural wine tasting workshops that I think could transform the take-up of behavioural finance by financial advisors in Australia. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Bianca Kent and Greg Davies. Woo! Welcome, Thank welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really keen, actually, about this. I'm, I've done some digging into Oxford Risk. I can't wait to dive into the detail. But before we do, all our listeners know we interrogate you a little upfront on your own use of technology. So, Bianca, what is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do, I do. I'm of that age bracket where I do use them and I still don't care if the young people don't think they're cool. So probably it's the uh, it's the cheeky one where it sticks its tongue out. <laughs> ah, I like it. See, that's got a little bit of personality. We love it. How about, Greg, how about you? Do you have one that you regularly use? I do. I don't know what it's called. It's that one that sort of the grimacing face with the, with the teeth bad. <laughs> I think that's the first time we've had that one. I wonder if that's a cultural thing. Like we should do some sort of survey, shouldn't we, from from different sides of the ocean and which ones are most popular. I do know that um, there's been studies, would you believe, um, that generationally the thumbs up, which is actually a very popular one over here, is considered by the uh, younger generations as a passive aggressive sign from I did read that bosses. recently. So, I thought, ah, ridiculous. Would you believe? Well, but but how interesting, right? Yeah. The words and the images we use, we all interpret them so differently. I just find that so fascinating. So then, Greg, if you, I'm assuming you, like the rest of us, you know, live attached to a smartphone. If you had to wipe everything off it, all the apps gone, and you just got to keep keep three, which three would you keep? Definitely Spotify. I'm I'm a music nut. I love to walk everywhere with noise cancelling headphones and listen to music. Um, yep. So that would be fine. Um, probably a podcast app for for similar reasons. Um, yep. And then I, th- I think I, I also use it quite a lot for the old fitness tracking stuff. So yeah, you know, okay. health, keeping track of okay. steps and how much I'm moving. So those would be the three. Yeah. Because I believe you're chair of a charity about music, aren't you, in the UK? So you've got a bit of a um, a leaning towards such things. That's right. It's the UK's national organisation for, for new music and, and composition. So all very experimental, cutting-edge stuff. Woo, fantastic. Well, and, and um, 
that's an interesting combination for me because, you know, my background's in actuarial studies and so people often think maths is just dry and, and corners, whereas, in fact, music has a beautiful mathematical element to it. So I love Absolutely. that combination. Love it. Bianca, how about you? If we if we whipped that phone away from you and wiped everything off, what would be the three that you'd have to have back? So I think, funnily enough, a bit like Greg, I'd need my health up because I'm, I'm an Apple Watch nut, so I'm always watching what I'm doing, how I'm sleeping, how my fitness is going. So that's one of them. Uh, I'd have to keep Instagram because I keep dreaming of a big house one day and what I want to do with it. So I like that, you know, inspiration <laughs> around how I decorate a home one day. And the third one is totally vain, yep. but it's an app that allows me to add makeup to my photos afterwards. So if I've had, you know, I've been a bit lazy and gone out without it. And I want to add some later on afterwards. It's really good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I love tools are so clever this day. Well, well, I mean, what do we, what would we do without them? Although now that you mention the Apple Watch, sort of laughing thinking that what would we would we even use apple watches if we only had three apps like would that make them something that was less interesting if you only had three things on them i wonder if anybody'd use maybe they'd just become a watch they'd go back to their original intention i wonder all right so let's dive into Oxford Risk. For the listeners, this is something that's new to me as well. So I'm really excited to dig into the tools that you guys have developed and and sort of this area of behavioral finance that, to be quite frank, is new to a lot of us. Um, it's something that we may have an instinct of in talking to lots of clients, but certainly are not as across the science as we could be. So I guess, you know, Greg, we might start with you. If you can help me get a sense, let's lift up and talk through where you guys fit in the whole fintech, you know, helping advisors space, you know, what category do you fall under? Who are you sort of generally lined up against? Oh, it's a difficult question because I, I think broadly speaking, there are two sets of things we do. The one yep. is, um, is well, let's, let's say three things. So the one is understanding clients more deeply. So yes. we use psychometric profiling tools. We, we build fact finds. It's all about understanding who you are, what you've got, where you're going. And, and, and so that, that would be the first thing. Uh, on its own, though, understanding clients doesn't really get you very much. You have to do something no. with it. And so that the, yeah. the two things that we deliver after that, one is suitability. So based on all the information I have on you, what is the right answer for your yep. risk level, for your asset allocation, et cetera? So trying to match you to the thing that's right for you in a, in a very data, evidence-based way. Yep. And then the, the other thing is is about guiding because – Unfortunately, telling someone what the right answer is is almost never enough for them to actually enact it and stick with it. So this is where a lot more of the behavioral science comes in. It is about yeah. making people more emotionally comfortable with yeah. the right answer and the journey towards it and the journey once you've got it. So keeping people emotionally comfortable through all the ups and downs of the investment cycle. Yeah, it's – um and. It that final piece is so important, isn't it? I'll often look at pundits on anything. It can be, it can be soccer. It can be it finance. It doesn't matter what it is. And you'll hear somebody that's been around a long time saying, "Yeah, I've been saying that for years, and nobody's listening." And okay. I instantly process as, "Well, you're saying it the wrong way, then. Like, if nobody yeah. was listening all along, where's the story? How can we engage? You know?" And so that journey um, is so important because none of us learn by being yelled at with facts. You know, there's there's the journey element of that is so important. No, and, and arguably that's what most of the financial services industry has done for the last 50 years is to go, yeah. we've crunched the numbers, we've built the portfolio, we've, I don't know, drawn an efficient frontier or whatever that is, and therefore here is the thing that you should do. Um, yeah. It's against that, that you actually, nobody buys a risk return trade-off. You know, People buy stories, they buy narratives. So you have to give yeah. them a story, you have to give them the comfort. And interestingly, you know, they're going to buy the story whether it's good for them or not. You know, and, and I think the public's reaction to things like cryptocurrency is a great example. We've had late 70 year old clients come to us after, you know, after having done a few things that weren't particularly the right path and they've leapt onto this bandwagon, you know, and, and it's stunning. You know, that's so interesting because that's, that's emotion. That's FOMO. That's all these things that have driven somebody to act in a way that you and I would probably argue isn't how they are actually. It's not, they wouldn't necessarily assess themselves as high risk or, or, you know, willing to take a punt, you know, but here they are behaving emotionally, you know. So, yeah, it's really important. You know, almost every deviation that we as humans do from good financial decision making behavior is because we've been tempted by a shiny story somewhere. And, yeah. you know, that had, 
people people don't like diversification because it means they have to hold boringly small bits of lots of things that yep. they've never heard of. What we like yep. is buying large chunks of things that we have heard of. And so, you know, yep. people will exchange a good portfolio of but it, it diversify a portfolio of good investments for a concentrated portfolio of good stories, which is a very different yep. thing. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've never really thought that through, but also, you know, if we're not combating the average or the misleading stories with appropriate stories, then what else are they going to consume? Yeah. Of course, they're going to, they're going to buy into that because they're not hearing anything else. Yeah. You know, you, voids don't change voids for, you know, don't stay voids for long. It gets filled and it can get filled with bad stories, things that are going to mislead, some things that are going to take them down the wrong path. Um, so I, yeah. So, and look, before we sort of dive into some more specifics, Bianca, I am curious about your perspective on, on you know, Europe and the UK versus Australia. I'm assuming that the messaging or the way we all talk to the public is pretty similar. You know, if, do you see a, a bit of any difference in in this, you know, ability to tell stories better or engage better, or are we all sort of on the same journey of learning how to do this better for the public? I think there there are a lot of similarities there. You know, the process is very similar. The stories are very similar. I think in this particular area, the UK is a little bit further forward. So I think, you know, probably because companies like us have been around for a while. Yep. So there's that extra step into looking at how to do this sort of thing better with clients. Whereas here, I'm thinking there's a little bit more of, you know, we've still got people that are pulling out risk profile descriptions and just sort of describing them and saying, oh, you sound like that one, rather than any sort of robust you know, process yeah. in place. I think it's we're we're moving along the same path, but it's slightly at a different pace. Yeah, and it's an interesting um, it's an interesting comment because one of the dangers I think with um, numbers and analysis is that the industry, but also the public, see these as truth. They don't see it as measuring of something. So when you do um, something like a risk profile, the the outcome balanced. That's the truth, right? That's just like, well, no, it was something that was designed to have a formula that gave an output. You need to understand the rigor of the thing behind all of that, or it could just be an output. It could be actually quite random or meaningless. And so I think, and it's a problem when we have numbers because people see those as black and white. Um, Whereas if you've been in the game long enough, you know that you can create numbers to show anything (laughs) and prove anything. Um, The rigor is so important. And I guess just taking a look at the content you guys have, I'm, I'm guessing that's a big part of who you are and what you guys do is that rigor. It's, it's what's behind it. It's what supports these tools. Exactly. And it's not about just the, the, those descriptions. I was just going to say that it's not just about that. It's also about how how that client is going to to feel and react. And that's the bit that they don't necessarily get just from a description or a number. Yeah. And, and you know, categorizing or labeling, all of these things can be helpful. They shouldn't be the only thing. And so I think that's where factoring in the behavior and potentially that journey, like you were talking about, Craig, I think is so important. So then let's, I guess, so it sounds like we've sort of got these two elements. Um, and let's start with the, I think it's called Investor Compass. Is that the key tool you know, for, for you know, vice practices or wealth management firms? So talk me through, like, what's the primary problem it was trying to solve? How did it come about such that and develop the way it has? You know, what was it responding to? Well, I can give a little bit of the, the history there. So, um, Oxford Risk for a long time really just did one thing. Um, and it did it. This is this is before uh, either of us us joined, but it really it, specialized in in risk profiling, measuring risk horrors, and it did it with a extreme um, degree of academic integrity and scientific data measurement, etc. But all it measured was was risk tolerance. And yep. you, you'll know as as well as I do that measuring risk tolerance is important, but it's only one small component of the whole ecosystem of what is the right answer for this client. So the very first thing that we started building out when when I joined Oxford Risk was to say, well, let's build the rest of that ecosystem. Let's build the suitability tools that will identify the right answer for you. And that right answer will be different, yes, depending on your risk tolerance level, but it will also be different depending on every aspect of, of every every asset and liability on your balance sheet, every future assets and liability, future cash flows, every one of those things changes your capacity to take risk with your investable assets now. So we look yep. at we look at them all in the whole. 
plus we bring in other things that the regulators require like um, tests of knowledge and experience and vulnerability, etc. So that investor compass is really a very holistic view uh, with lots and lots of moving parts, all brought together in a very consistent way into a big algorithm that goes, what is the right answer? What is the right level of risk for you to take with a full digital audit trail of where that answer has come from and how it will change if your income goes up, if your plans and goals change, and if you know, if anything in your financial circumstances change, that answer will change. So it can turn suitability into something extremely dynamic and extremely defensible because it's looking at the person as a whole, not just their assets and liabilities, but their future time horizons, cash flows, goals, and numerous aspects of their financial personality. Okay. So so to give it a bit of analogy, um, for those who haven't sort of experienced something like bef- – and to Bianca's point, there's lots of advisors in Australia that wouldn't have used a tool like that before. Then the difference is, you know, what we might be using for a risk profile is sort of like taking your blood pressure. It's a point in time and it's for one single thing and you get an output. Um, what you guys are talking about here is more like a full body scan that's quite dynamic and it's going to adjust based on what's going on in all sorts of parts of the body. You know, it's not just one element. Is that a valid sort of thing? It's got a lot more depth depth and complexity to it and adjustment than, you know, just this one thing in time. I quite like that. I might steal that analogy. (laughs) Done. I won't charge you much. It's all right. (laughs) (laughs) So then, okay, so I'm guessing without um, you having said it explicitly that the other things that are getting factored in with lots of talks about um, ESG and other ridiculous acronyms we come up within our industry that those are some of the other things that you're factoring in now, that that's part of the picture of this individual is also what they're interested in, what they value, you know, what they therefore, you know, what lens they want to apply to where they put money. Is that valid? Yeah, yes, definitely. So so within that, um, we've gone through, Greg's gone through sort of the major bits, the behavioural side, some of the things we'd cover are a client's confidence levels, their composure. I like to call it the freak out meter. Are they going to freak out when the markets drop? You've yeah. got that information and that's all giving you that suitable result. And then we've got an extra module around ESG. So this is now how you can start talking to your client, identifying, are they interested? Are they a bit apprehensive about it? How do they feel mm. about the potential? And and this is sort of controversial depending on which advisor you talk to as to whether there is a trade-off to invest in sustainable investments or not. But is the client willing to make that? So that gives you an extra layer. So if you've come to a sort of a level of investment risk that's suitable for them, then you're sort of looking at, well, do we need to put them in some ESG products or not? So it gives you that extra level around how to look at what you sh- where you should put them. And the ESG thing is interesting. I think um- – you know, originally when it, this all first came up, you were really looking at the same category of people who were, um, you know, sort of standing in front of the coal mine, strapping themselves to the to the machine and stopping the things happening, right? So it was that sort of uh, extremist is unfair, but really extreme views or, or passion about something. Whereas I think where we are at now, and it's why we need tools like this, is I think it's it's now about broader awareness. People are really more aware that this is something they want to start thinking about and they're not necessarily ready to act, but to help them understand a bit better about how they feel about it, right? So help get them that clarity and then even just be able to tell them, and this is where your current investments sit. You know, we're not talking any change here yet. Just that awareness, I think, is it's sort of in that category of just sorting a little bit of your rubbish out into recycling bins. Like it's nothing, it doesn't feel world changing, but it's part of the process. You know, it's part of what we all need to go down to better understand these things. So I think it's really important we have powerful tools to help draw that out because most of the a most of the public don't know what ESG is, <laughs> or what the individual elements of that are, um, and also once they start to understand that, I've had a lot of people saying, "Well, of course I care about that." <laughs> like they never realised that they never realised their investments might not have. Like it's one of those. What do you mean yep. they're investing in that? What? And I'm not even talking about necessarily climate or anything like that. It could be gender equality in businesses, or it could be you know governance. You know, like all these things. Wait a minute, aren't they filtering for that already? You know, it's such an interesting um, realization, I think, for the public that they just thought that was already happening. Yeah. And, and we've, you know, we've done um, research studies of people's preferences for ESG across four continents now. And we get much the same headline answer, regardless of where you look, that about 
70 to 80% of people will go, yeah, of course I want my my wealth to be aligned to my values. Um, you know, I want, it, I, I want to do some good with my wealth. And it doesn't mean that they necessarily, you know, want to walk around in a hair shirt and, and donate every penny uh, to charity. But equally, they they want to feel comfortable that their wealth right. is doing some good. And um, I think large swathes of that population just simply haven't had, as you said, the awareness or the, or the ability to access it. So simply making people aware of that first step can then start to bring them on a on a journey. It's always a journey, isn't it? Bring them on a yeah. journey to um, you know to to, to 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 sort of figuring out what the right fit is for them. And it's maybe that's buying these cheap products. Again, you're right. Terminology is is, is dreadful around this jargon and terminology. I mean, what, the one redeeming feature of ESG is that it's easy to spell. But um, yeah. if, um, if the the you know, there might be that, or it might be engagement. It might be you know doing something a bit a bit more and a bit a bit deeper. But trying to match people to solutions is is really where we're at, because some people will be more comfortable with it, some people will be less. And the evidence suggests that for the people who really do like ESG, in 2022, when the markets you know plummeted and everyone got bad returns, the Morningstar evidence that came out is that. The funds in the world that were ESG labeled, the investors investments were much, much stickier because people have a reason not to sell that fund. It's no longer just about <laughs> returns. They go, well, I'm going to sell something on my portfolio because I'm scared. Well, the thing I won't sell is the thing that's give, I've got an emotional reason to hang on to. Mm, interesting. Isn't that interesting because the, the emotion is potentially um, creating the better investor behavior too. So exactly. not overreacting, not pulling out, not not arm oh, waving panic, you know, like it's how interesting that it's but it's not a it's not because of the logical reason for that. It's an emotional reason. But who cares, right? If it gets the right outcome, um, yep. that's a good thing. So that's that's an interesting insight in terms of for advisors about ensuring that our clients are more connected to where their money's invested because that will make a difference. You know, because they make they're not making a choice to get out of that fund. They're making a choice to get out of that underlying thing, that underlying yep. company or, or or cause or whatever they've you know they've um, invested in. So yeah, that's an interesting um, difference and insight. Wow, human it's beings! All, I tell you, back, you know, back back to stories and emotional comfort again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So in terms of then the tools, then with you know, investor Com- compass is clearly. You know, operates within the advice practice, but the clients interact with it. Is that correct? So they they might get sent some questionnaires, something, some sort of engagement tool. How does that work? What we through through that experience from the client's perspective? Absolutely. So Investor Compass, the the, the main tool is is a web tool. So basically, the advisors go in, they have their access. You can give your power players, etc., and you'll go in and set your client up and decide what do I want to send them? So we've got the four modules. You might send them all four in one go. You might send them two now and maybe the ESG one later when you've you know talked about them a few more things. And they can either fill it out online. So you can email it to them. You can email it directly from the system, print out a PDF if they're not <laughs> technologically advanced. They can <laughs> fill that out and then you know your administrator can pop the questions in later and then the system will do all the calculations and you get your result, which is on screen. So you can go through and show them images and descriptions of everything. And you can also have a report. So you get a client report and an advisor report for compliance that you can keep on their file that goes through everything that all the steps of how we got to the the responses and the and the answer at the end. Fantastic. Okay, so there's an an immediate output of that um, energy by them. I think that's something that's a bit of a flaw with advice is often a process will be you know, extracting a whole lot of information from them and having to collate and them doing things and then silence for a long period of time as we work. And then suddenly we, we you know, slap them over the head with a 60-page document full of all sorts of scary things. So so I like the idea that there could be quite an immediate report. They could get something that, that for their immediate effort of answering all these questions, they get something insightful. So I think that's a great win as well. Exactly. That's what I, I liked about it because I, I have, again, I agree with you. So often you get no nothing from all that work you've done, whereas here you can actually start to read about it and think about it. And then potentially if you've if the client's done it before the, the meeting, they've come with questions and they're armed to talk to you about what they've read about themselves. And they're you know, usually quite engaged going, oh, I didn't know I had you know low composure and what does that mean for me sort of thing. So, Greg, what's your view as, as um, 
And there's sort of two approaches to these things currently in the way I see them here. Sorry, not these things. Let's just talk risk profiling, even though this is then, this is yeah. like 3D, you know, AI version really of risk profiling. But, but there's two approaches. One, you know, you send something to the client cold, you let them answer it in their own world and in their own environment without input. And then you have a discussion, whereas others will walk the client through it um, in a meeting. And I've, I have to admit that second one, I've always, been wary of my own influence on their answers. And so I'm curious what your insight into, into that is and whether we need to make sure, you know, what are the behaviors we should have um, as the guide in this process yeah. so that we get, you know, the actual response from the client. So I, I, I agree completely. I think getting uh, the client to ascertain that their risk tolerance independently is hugely important. I mean, the advisor all of us have influence on on others when we're working through things with them. But you've got an advisor-client relationship. This person has come to you precisely because they're not the expert in it. And advisors with the best one in the world are themselves somewhere on a risk tolerance spectrum. Uh, and most <laughs> of them tend to actually be, uh, if you take a, you know, a, a sample of the advisor population, they will all... Um, they will tend to be towards the higher end relative to the the broad population. Yep. So there's always going to be a, a tendency for the advisors, and, and this is not to say that they're doing this intentionally or, or in any way, but of course they know what they think the right answer is for them, and that, that will be influencing things. The one thing I would say, though, is that if you're going to get the client to answer questions themselves to arrive at a risk tolerance, those questions had better be well designed. Yeah. Um, and we see a lot of tools out there where, Someone has just slapped a few questions onto a piece of paper that they think are relevant, some random scoring method, and then it comes out. You know, we spent a huge amount of time testing hundreds of different questions on samples of thousands of individuals, um, figuring out, you know, when we score it, how do we how do we norm those scores to make – because some things people will naturally tend to want to agree with more or less, so right. there are biases and responses. You've got to correct for all of those things. Um, and there are some extremely bad ways of eliciting risk tolerance. Uh, and most of them are bad for a very simple reason. If I'm measuring your risk tolerance because I want to build for you a portfolio you will hold for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what I want to know is what is your willingness to trade off risk in return in the long run? Right. What we often, if I present with you questions and go, how much risk are you prepared to take? You, I will get an answer from you. But it is much more likely that that answer will be an answer to the question, how do you feel about taking risk this morning than right. your long-term willingness to trade off risk in return? It comes with all of the baggage of what's in the newspapers this morning, what did my friends tell me about their investments over the weekends, et cetera. And yeah. if I build for you a portfolio that you're going to hold for 10 years based on the fact that you happen to read bad news in the newspaper this morning, I've really not done my job very well. So it's right. very important to make sure that we're measuring the right thing there. And conversely, I can imagine, um, you know, we've got our, our complicated but now long-running retro solutions in Australia now where it's, you know, we have to put the money into superannuation and all that sort of behaviour. And so lots of people view that money as a side for a long time. So therefore, their willingness to take risk is high just because they don't really think about it. Right? So it's sort of a side. However, yep. once they're living off that money, then suddenly – their reality and, and the way they react to risk in that portfolio is so different because they're very well aware that this is it. This is the money they have and this is what they need to live off. And so, you know, that context, you're absolutely right. It's, it's so important um, because their behaviors will be fundamentally different in those environments and all the stages in between, um, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, the attention we direct to things change, changes. The, the, the biggest question issue really is that when we view things in short time slices, uh, risk feels negative. Yeah. Taking money from somewhere safe, a savings account and put it in, 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 in investments feels like a really negative trade-off because I moved from safe to risky. Yeah. Actually, if I'm holding these investments for the next 10 or 15 years, the risky thing is leaving it in the savings account. <laughs> so our psychological intuitions in the short term are completely opposite to the reality of what we should be doing in the long term. And that's why we have to shield ourselves against them. Yeah. Has there been, and this is just off the cuff, and I apologize for putting you on the spot here, but is there any 
change, for example, like, you know, social media and the way we respond to stimuli or information or the speed with which we get it? Are we, are you seeing, you know, in the history of the study you're doing into behavior and what we do, has that changed based on the way that we're all interacting with things differently now? Is there any, any evidence to suggest that people may behave differently because they may react? They're getting the information faster, even if it's bad information and reacting faster, anything like that that you're seeing? So I don't think the fundamental aspects of human psychology have shifted. Yeah. But because information is so accessible and so fast, um, the dangers of it are hitting a much wider population more of the time. Right. And so, you know, we could go back to South Sea Bubble or, you know, when you, you really had to go into the city and hang out outside a coffee house and, you know, get into the, the crowd itself to do this. Whereas now all I have to do is is turn on my computer and I'm bombarded by short term highly granular information. Yeah. So I think it, it's not it's not changed humans, but it certainly has made more humans uh, susceptible to the dangers of the information coming in. Yeah. So that then means the framework within which, and I guess that's part of what advisors are building for clients over time, is a framework to to engage with or filter those sort of messaging through. That's where you know there's we need to strengthen that to enable the client to process that sort of information, you know, and and understand which parts are completely valid. Curiosity is a good thing. Absolutely, ask the question versus helping them identify noise, as an example. You know, this is just noise. They're trying to get a click. Right? So you, yeah. you're not helping yourself or anybody by responding to that. Yeah, I've seen a lot of dangers of that in the pandemic. You know, the whole story about. Robin Hood and GameStop and meme yeah. stocks and cryptocurrencies. That this is often was a, a highly um, vulnerable population because it was mostly actually exactly the people that financial services struggle to to access, which yep. is young people yep. uh, who are sitting at home in a pandemic with lots of time in their hands and you know taking punts on falling knives. Yep, uh, it potentially very very dangerous. And you know if there's there are things that we really should be trying to encourage people to engage more with their finances. They should be thinking about, you know, not just leaving cash sitting, doing nothing year after year, et cetera. Thinking about engaging with financial planning, thinking about engaging with the structure of your finances. Yep. But we should be encouraging them to disengage with the day by day ups and downs of the markets going red and green and red right. and green and red and green. Yep. Because that's just what markets do. <laughs> like yep. it's just, this is what they are. So, Bianca, in terms of practices that have, you know, rolled this, you know, or, or folded this into the experience, who do you see that this works really well for? And who do you think either struggles or, or find, you know, they might play with it a bit that then, then don't roll it out? You know, where does it, where does it really land? And is it down to the way they implement it, which I'm, I'm betting it is, but you know, what, how do they, how do they fold this in well into a practice? So I think, I mean, if we look at Australia at the moment, we're still relatively new. So we've started to mostly work with some smaller uh, sort of boutique yep. firms who are going, who are finding it easy to, to slot something in because they've not got, you know, lots of different processes and they're probably a lot slicker with where they are. Um, so we've had, we, we've had some good clients that are starting to work with us in that space now. If I look wider into a sort of our UK client base, We've got everyone using it from sort of one-man bands to large nationals, licensees, private banks, retail banks. Pretty much everybody does because we can work it in different ways. We've got the web tool that you can come in, use straight away, but we've also got an API suite. So if you're the type of business that actually likes to build your processes and link them all together, you can build it in the way that you want as well. Um, and we also do integrations. So that's another way. So w when we work with firms that are, you know, either doing the integration themselves or working with CRMs that we integrate with, that's where it also helps because you're saving that double keying, you know, bringing all your client information in to make it quicker and that makes it a lot easier to use. Um, and we've started building integrations in Australia actually already. We've got our first one with Intelliflow, who are a new, another new launch out yep. here and we're looking at Xplan next, hopefully the next a couple of months and after that we're going to work on um, client requests, so which CRMs people are interested in and out here. And look, the... Um Integrate. I mean, 
you know, I love tech. Clearly, I'm hosting a tech podcast, <laughs> but but um, and integration is one of those. It's like that green tick that's like an automatic interest for me. You know, so if you're integrate, woohoo! You know, I really want to understand better. But I do think that it is easy to focus on that almost first before seeing the wins you can get out of the tool anyway. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's it's um, I find myself going, oh, it integrates, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then actually, you know, I could just you know, implement something like this in the practice and would see value anyway, even if it was manual, even if we had to, you know, re-enter or re-key or any of those sort of things, those things are solved by members of the team. You can have people that solve that. Whereas, you know, rolling this out so that it, it can truly impact the clients and their experience, I think, um, you know, that's where, you know, that's where the real gold is going to sit. And I guess to that, to that yeah. end, is this something that when people start or practice starts, you know, it's really just the advisor, the client, like those are the only users or or do you find that the rest of the practice in terms of the process or the way they roll it out can get involved? Can they, you know, utilize the tool and take part as well? I think it's, you know, it, it's predominantly the advisor, but it depends on the practice. So we've got a lot of companies that, that rely heavily on power planners to do a lot of that work, preparing um, the client files, actually doing the reports afterwards. So they get very involved with sending out the, the uh, assessments and then looking at ha- what's happened afterwards and prepping that information for the advisor then to have those discussions. So definitely yeah. I think advisor and your power planners are, are very well into that process. Well, now there's another, there were, what, what we've started doing actually now for a lot of our sort of medium size and larger clients is also just the, the, the management information that you get out of this. Because we have individual personality measures or not multiple dimensions of every one of their clients. So we can start to use that for attitudinal segmentations, help people understand their client base much more effectively. And this is where some of the guidance stuff comes. Because imagine you have an incredibly volatile week in the markets. Mm. And on Monday morning, all your advisors come in, if you're a, a reasonable size firm, and they sit down and turn on their screens. And what you want to know is, how do I best deploy my time as an advisor to where it's most useful? Because markets are going mad. I want to know who do I call first wow. with what message? So if I know I, the system is going to tell me which clients have logged in over the weekend, what their portfolio has done in the, in the last week or the last two weeks, which of them have composure scores that are low or impulsivity scores that are high or um, confidence scores that were low. So we can look at different segments of that population based on behavioral attributes and what we're observing in terms of their interaction with you know, their finances online, et cetera, and start to make sure that as advisors, we're actually empowering advisors to use the really valuable human, act- in human interaction they've got, but in a much more targeted and, um, uh, and focused way. Interesting. And, and as somebody who does, um, lean towards trying to find one to many solutions as well, then, you know, the content you could be pulling together. If you start to see themes or groups, then you could start to really tailor content to specific behaviors. Um, and that's, it's, it's really engaging, right? I found that I did the um, Gallup testing and we did it with the team. And that's that real DNA of, of what you're about, which I love. And of course, the emails you then get from them are really tailored to your different strengths, you know, and, and yeah. you're instantly like, oh, that's interesting. Well, of course, it's interesting. They've <laughs> like narrowed it down <laughs> to what you tested for. But, but we don't we don't generally do that um, in financial services for characteristics. We might because you're 50 or 60 or, you know, like <laughs> we might do it by age, but not necess- not by behavior. Um, that's really interesting. Good advisors will be doing this intuitively if Correct. they know their clients, right? But not all advisors are equally good intuitive psychologists. Not all of them have had all their clients for long enough to know them that, that deeply. And if you inherit a, a, a book of clients from someone else, you want to be having this effect right from the word go rather than waiting 15 years until you figure out who do I call and who I don't call. So it can be very effective even for really good advisors who are doing all the right things already. And we all know, like we have bias by the way we process data anyway. And I mean by, you know, you might, we might have a picture of the, our client base, right? Most of my clients are blah, whatever the thing is. Um, but 
often, you know, when I chat to practices and, and work with them, I can see that really that's based on the people they either like to deal with or that they engage with a lot. It's actually not where the volume sits. So yeah. getting this data so they can really understand where the groups are within their business and then tailor, um, even if it is a style of webinar or a style of content for those people, um, wow, that's going to bring them much closer. Um, to the advisors right. and to the practice, you know, which is exciting. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is design in these things and even look um, look and feel. Um, I hark back to when I was at school, we had, I did uh, high level maths, it's called, well, it was called four units, four unit maths in Australia, it's not called that anymore. Um, but there was a, uh, a textbook we all had to use that was written by a guy called Jim Coronius and it has the worst font ever designed and it was this horrible textbook and it was all jammed in and it was all these formulas and it was traumatic opening the book like before you even got to doing any of the work you had to do and any of the questions you were already traumatized and convinced you were going to fail and i feel like we do that a little with testing for clients in our industry where it feels a bit overwhelming and clunky and there's numbers so i'm curious about what you guys are doing in terms of the design or the experience for the client as they're doing these, you know, going through these tools so that it doesn't feel, you know, traumatic or, or incomprehensible to them. Yeah. So I think, you know, two things that we bring into our design uh, right from the outset. And the one is trying to keep things as simple as possible, mm -hmm. but no simpler. Um, <laughs> our profiling tools and our fact finds are actually remarkably quick and easy to, to do. You know, we, a standard one, you might be asking people questions to measure five different aspects of their financial personality. And if you went through the questions that gave us stable scores on each of those five dimensions, it wouldn't take you longer than two, maybe two and a half minutes if you were really stretching it. Okay. Right. So just keep it because all of our questions, we, we, we just keep the style really, really clean and simple. Uh, and so keeping things short keeps people interested. Yeah. The other one we've touched on already is feedback. Give people something back very quickly Yeah. because that's what keeps them interested. And people like hearing things about themselves. Mm. You know, they, you know, the Gallup thing or you know, there's, there's loads, loads of these things. We all like hearing things about ourselves. But if I have to fill in a form and then wait two weeks for my advisor to come back and tell me what they think, yeah. it's not a great experience. Whereas the, by using the technology – we can feed things back very, very quickly. And actually, far from the questioning process being off-putting, it can be part of the uh, the positive engagement experience itself. Yeah, okay. And Bianca, in terms of what you see people using in Australia currently, then what would you say is the difference in terms of the user experience for uh, you know your tool versus what we currently use in a somewhat clunky manner for this type of <laughs> this type of questioning of clients? Yeah, absolutely. So just to expand on what Greg said, I think another another key element is there's no maths in it, so our questions don't yeah. mean the client doesn't have to sit there and go. 20% versus 10% and that sort of thing. So that keeps it really clean and simple. Very simple things like large font. We use really mm. large font so that everybody can read it easily. Um, advisors can brand it to their own colors. So you can add your logo, you can change the coloring to make sure it suits you. Um, and and it, it's just the user experience is really simple. The clients can click through, question comes up at a time. If someone calls them and they need to stop and chat, they don't lose what they've gone through. Simple things like that just to make it really easy to use. Yeah, it's important. And I mean, you mentioned um, maths. Um, and once again, you know, maths freak, maths is probably my natural language if I was to have one. Um, what I've come to realize, though, of years of wonderful friends that have been very open and honest with me is I've sort of, you know, to learn to engage with people from different backgrounds and different sort of experiences is there's a big portion of the public that actually don't intuitively understand what a percent is. Like they truly don't. And we talk to them like they do. In fact, we talk to them like they understand the formula you use to calculate such a thing. And and that's not because they're stupid or not at all. It's just it they haven't been saturated with this. There was a, a moment in schooling where they had to do this thing and and it probably was a bit traumatic for lots of people, maths was. Um, and then from that point on, why would they? You know, it, it's just not yeah. something they've engaged with. And so I think we really need to make sure that we're not just due to our 
our, you know, funny signs and symbols we use as part of our communication that we're not missing a whole element of understanding, but also interaction with the client because they're sort of just nodding, but not understanding. And you'll probably be happy to know that there's lots of um, academic evidence in the psychology world of, of exactly that. Yeah. People, um, a lot of it's actually in, in the health, in the health um, area, you know, people will make a very different decision if they are told 22% of people will, will die of this disease versus um, 22 people out of 100 will die right. of this disease. Now, you and I know those are exactly the same numbers. Sure. But they have very different emotional tags on them, and, and people will do, do different things. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Percentages, and that's before we even come to you know, compounding or <laughs> yeah. other, uh, other things that people just don't have good intuitive feel for. No, no, not at all. And once again, that's where storytelling plays a part, doesn't it? I mean, I had somebody that I was talking to and, and I could see, you know, compounding and all these sort of things weren't making any sense. And um, and I knew that they were, they they actually wanted to become an Instagram influencer, which I find it's a bit like a celebrity chef. I'm not sure that's actually a job, you know, like, but anyway, we were talking to them um, about that. And, and I said, oh, well, you know, when there's a post and there's just a couple of, a couple of, you know, likes, but then it just goes viral. It goes nuts. And every post you know, sorry, every like begets more likes, begets more likes. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, that's compounding. <laughs> that's okay. Viral. I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's what it is, you know? So, but it's so true. And, and, you know, we can't, we can't judge or have disdain for that. I think that's probably, to be fair, I think the industry for a hundred years probably has had a bit of disdain about our understanding versus the public's. Um, when in reality, you know, their very existence is what makes us it possible to do what we do. So I think that we do need to flip the script a bit there. Um, and it's not about talking at their level. It's getting rid of all the th- almost the acronyms and things we hide behind, you know, and communicating yeah. a, in a real way, you know, um, such that you can really draw out um, behaviours because it will be so insightful for them. You know, they'll learn a lot more about yeah. themselves. It's one of the areas the UK regulators are starting to look very closely at information presentation and its effect on on decisions. And you could take two people with exactly the same portfolio, and one of them, you send them a report every week showing how all of the 50 things in that portfolio have done in the last week, uh, and that person is going to see things flashing red every <laughs> week, and they're going to be nervous and stressed and anxious. Or you take the same portfolio, and every six months you send someone a report showing how the whole portfolio has been doing on a rolling three-year basis. Yeah. Same portfolio, that person may never see anything red. Yeah. And they're in a completely different emotional state just because of the design choices of the information you've put in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And because ultimately as well, what you're giving is context, you know, not information. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily easy to do, um, but it's absolutely necessary. And it sounds like then what um, you guys are, are providing in these tools is more context because it's not just the context of the outside world, it's the context of the person that's absorbing it. So it's sort of bringing those two things together um, so that we can really make it match. So then, Bianca, in terms of um, current users, are there there any elements of the tech or or the tools that people just don't really quite take advantage of? Like, I can't believe more people don't use this. Like, are there any little gems in there that you feel like more people could take advantage of? I think the the one area that... uh we haven't had as many people use is probably the the risk capacity module. And that's, I think some of it's okay. down to, um, you know, they're doing maybe cash flow elsewhere. So they're, they're thinking it's sort of a double up. So that that's one area I think people should use a little bit more because our version is really, you know, it's not a cash flow, but it's a good risk capacity. And it brings that whole story together. So I think that's the one area that if they're not using it already, really should be using it. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the way that a practice can then engage with this, is it easy for, I mean, cause all of us, you know, have so many tech, let alone processes, let alone products to consider and fold in. Is it easy to, for example, use the tool, engage and just use the tool, say with the staff, okay, let's try this out. How do you experience like, is it, is it easy to do that and sort of almost trial it out before you then roll it out completely? How do you guys engage with a practice in that sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, when I'm doing uh, trials with different firms, the first thing I suggest everyone does is that everyone actually completes the questionnaires themselves. So do it, find out what your investor personality is like, see what the client experience is so that then you know what your clients are going to experience. To me, that's the number one thing. If you know what your clients are going to experience, you can then explain it to them better. 
but uh, but otherwise you don't that that helps teach them and also then you can get your your staff involved so say for example you, you've got existing clients and you don't want them to have to fill out their um their assets and liabilities your administrator can do that so the tool lets them do that and then yeah. the client can then finish all of the stuff that they need to do yeah fantastic and so you okay so there there could be a, a journey that then you could you could almost um, take somebody down where there might be a call to talk them through okay this information and that could be from a support person let's just get that in all right next step you know get comfy get a cup of tea we're gonna we're gonna uh, dig a bit deeper do that on your own and then there'll be the report like you could sort of design a way that you engage with the client um, to you know extract that information such that it doesn't feel like an extraction. <laughs> Um, it doesn't feel quite as painful as it otherwise does. So that's exciting. That's um, that's an interesting way to go. In terms of then the future, so Greg, is there? I'm imagining there's sort of things you guys are working on or or elements you're adding. So I'm curious about the next ones, but I'm also curious about the gee, I'd love it if you know down the track where you could take this. So talk to me about where, you know, Oxford Risk is going and what you guys are doing, but also maybe even where you and Bianca, where you could, I'd love to see this go this far. Well, see, the, the whole ESG world is still developing yep. because it's new and the regulation is, 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 is coming and catching up. So that's one area that we will continue to be developing heavily. We're, in my view, really, as an industry, only just scratching the surface of what we can do with personalized communication and content and, and matching engagement, hyper-personalizing it to what we know about someone's personality, et cetera. Right. That is the bit where I really think um, we've got we've we've got the baseline, we've got the we've got the personality profiling tools, we know a lot about what we want to say, but to hugely systematize that. So those systems are supporting advisors. That 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 is the really exciting bit. And then the one for the future for me is a lot of what we've been talking about here is investments. And We've done a little bit of work on this so far, but to broaden it out from investments to look at someone's whole financial position, financial well-being, yeah. debt management, savings behavior, investing, the balance between short, medium, and long-term, et cetera. Once we've built and tested that these things can effectively help people make better investment decisions or give better investment advice, there's absolutely no reason why the same engagement tools can't be used um, on a much broader range of people, on a much on a more holistic uh, view of their wealth. That's yeah, that's pretty exciting because I actually think that's when you really start to shift the dial. You, because yeah. to be frank, there's no point talking about investing if you can't spend less than you earn. <laughs> like you yeah. know, and so I mean, it's natural that, that that's where we all live, so that's where we've started. But I agree with you in terms of impact. You know, wonderful. Yeah joyful impact. Um, that's where it's going to be. And interestingly, I think certainly in Australia, and I'd be curious about the UK, I think there is some skepticism in, in, in well, government, but as well in financial services about, oh, but people just aren't going to pay for that. Um, and or they won't pay for advice. And I'm like, well, I think what we've proven is they won't necessarily pay for the advice the way it's given now. You know, whereas yeah. if they could get transformation in their day to day, you know, and how they feel about their cash flow, I actually think yep. they will, you know, because they can, it's material, you know, and it's immediate. Um, so yep. I'm no, with I, you. I think that, yeah, that'd be really exciting. Also, and because the power of this is really doing it by bringing behavioral science together with data, together with technology, right. it's scalable, right? Once you've built it, it, it's absolutely scalable. And therefore, your marginal cost of delivering this to people who perhaps won't or can't pay very much for it is is very low. Yep. So I'm quite positive about the ability for these ideas to to reach large swathes of people who, who who genuinely need it. I mean, of course, we have to build it and we have to demonstrate the business case, etc. But you know, I think there's a lot to be done still, huge amounts. Yeah, and it's interesting you say like, so we've got the tool already, um, but it's then how does it, you know, how do we apply it for the personalization? What's so interesting is outside financial services. I mean, personalization is, I mean, in retail or any widgets, you know, that sort of stuff, personalization is a given. I mean, even small yep. business CRMs can personalize to that extent. You know, so it's sort of stunning that in financial advice and financial services that we have, we just haven't got there. 
you know, and and even to the extent of large insurance companies or platform providers, or you know, they're still not. They might. To the, to the extent of your age, but but they're still not doing that, and it, it's so stunning when this other side is just nailing it. I mean, a, and a simple example that everybody's experienced is Amazon and what you see when you log into Amazon. Like it's the ultimate personalization of your experience. Like when I log in, you know, each three of us would see a completely different Amazon when we logged in um, because they're collecting that and and learning, you know, how to put what we want or maybe not need, but want in front of us. And so it's not like it's not like the tech or the skills need to be developed or built. We've just got to learn from yep. the others that are doing it well, I think. Yep. Yeah. So, and Bianca, in terms of you watching this, like you say, it's it's so early here in Australia for this. Um, then you know, what are you hoping or or looking to see down the path of of either where this applies or where you guys can take this for the you know Australian financial advice or the Australian consumer? Oh, well, I I think really I hope you know we're we're helping all of the advisors out there. You know, I think this is. Our goal is to help advisors help their clients make better decisions, and that's what we want to do. And I yeah. think this is, you know, something that is going to help everyone. So really, I hopefully, I hope I'm going to be speaking to everyone over the next, you know, <laughs> six to twelve months, and and helping you make make your clients' lives, clients lives better. And I, I mean, <clears throat> it's almost a perfect storm for this sort of tool. I think after what we've all just gone through, then I think even if it's not related to finance, I think we've all become very aware of how our behaviour responds to external stimuli, right? <laughs> Whether that's a pandemic yep. or a lockdown or whatever happens, um, I think we're all becoming a bit more aware of the fact that there is this this dynamic interaction that goes on, and our behaviour does get influenced. So I do think there's a a great sort of wave of understanding we can ride for these tools um, to help people give that insight. Is there anything we've missed, like any big chunks that we've missed or parts of the tool you feel we should cover off? I think the one thing I'd mention is that we're uh, very close to launching an updated version of the tool um, with some great you know, new graphics to make it easy to use, but also a bit of functionality that I think is going to be really useful is um, a portfolio risk tool. So imagine you've got a, a new client that's come to you with a whole bunch of existing investments. How can you look at that risk level compared to the way you measure risk now? So you're able to put that into the tool and it's going to straight away give you a risk score for that portfolio so that you can say, oh, okay, we've actually assessed that you're a medium high risk, but your current portfolio is only low. So you are not where you should be. So that's going to really help you in the advice process, particularly when you're looking at new clients. That's fantastic because it um, it's so powerful almost to have those. It's like a traffic light tool, right? It's just something that line in the sand, you're above or below, let's take some action as opposed to here's our 47 comments on, you know, <laughs> it doesn't help them frame um, what you're trying to put forward. Fantastic. Um, anything else, Greg, you feel we've missed or that you want to jump in with or any insights you think that um, our listeners could benefit from? I would just maybe expand on that on that last point that Bianca was ma- making. I think you know we are very consciously a behavioral company, and that's our, our DNA. But equally, a behavioral science and behavioral finance on its own isn't that useful unless you are wedding it to a really deep knowledge of traditional quantitative finance and portfolio theory, et cetera. Yep. And you've been, you know, mentioned you know your 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 maths background, and I also originally have a quant on finance and maths background. And to me, the real importance here is the two have to work together. Mm. You know, the, the traditional tools of finance theory and portfolio theory, they kind of tell us what the right answer is in in a in a very um isolated way. Yeah. But it, it's a pure, it's a pure right answer. It's not the right answer for any one person because it assumes that we're all Spock, right? Yeah. Yeah. But um and the behavioral science comes in and goes, okay, we believe that we want to aspire to being rational individuals, but we accept that we're not. So the, the the coupling of the behavioral science, looking at emotional comfort and the stories of the narratives, but if we did only that and we didn't understand the realities of risk and return and that, we wouldn't really be helping people. It's when the two come together, um, the traditional finance and the behavioral finance, that's kind of where we see our USB sitting at the middle. Yeah, okay. And, and well, and that's what's, that's what's difficult, right? That's the hard part. Yep. <laughs> the can sit in isolation. It's the it's the blending of the two, and that's true of anything. Anytime you bring, you know, two sciences or two two elements together, that's where it's hard is the application in the middle. Um, but I think, like yep. you, I think 
that's where some some magic is going to happen. I guess that's really where the alchemy is, right? It's that middle bit. Um, yeah. And it's going to look like magic, but we know it's really science. And, you know, it's going to be really wonderful in terms of the impacts that it can have on clients. All righty, Advice Explorers. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Oxford Risk, then the website link is in the episode show notes, along with Bianca and Greg's LinkedIn details. So so please feel free to reach out to them. I'm sure they'll put point you in the right direction of who that you should talk to. I'm imagine yeah. Bianca for the for the um Australian advisors, probably the first port of call, but I would encourage you to follow Greg. He's got some great content on, um, you know, this sort of behavioral finance insights and really understanding how we bring, make it real, um, for our clients. Look, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I think, you know, these tools are the sort of things that can take us away from talking about returns and markets and start talking about human beings and the way we behave. And I think that's how we can really transform our industry and the way we engage. So thank you for your time. And can I just say that, you know, Greg, I really think we need to get you out of, out to Australia for one of these um, wine behavioral tasting experiences, because uh, I reckon you guys would get everybody signing up at that point. <laughs> I would do that with pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rianka, your one task out of the podcast this episode <laughs> is to is to get him out here. I, I think we'd we'd all love it, and I I love learning through something that's parallel but not the same. So, I think that's a great a great way to go. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. It was lovely. So. Are you a current user of Oxford Risk? Um, I'm really curious if you have. I, and in fact, I'd love uh, to hear from you on the Ensemble platform. Um, if you are one of the sort of earlier users uh, in Australia, I think, you know, we'd all be fascinated about how you're finding the tool. And in particular, you know, how you made that transition from maybe some of the older school risk profiling, you know, data collection, all those sort of tools into something like this. Um, and you now, as I think about, you know, tools – and the way they've approached this, the behavioral finance sort of angle, then, you know, I'm really excited about the possibility that we can start, you know, using these tools for the one-on-one -on -one experience, absolutely, the early entree into our practice, into the way we can add value, but that then over time we can also take those insights we've gained on that individual and deliver hyper-personalized content and engagement. That is something that will heighten the way they engage with us um, and even the way they perceive their finances. If it really feels so personal and such that we understand them that deeply. So they don't get the generic newsletter. They get something very short on the email that's dealing with, wow, I bet you're feeling like this about whatever's just happened in say the news or markets or, you know, those sort of things. So I think um, this concept of hyper-personalized engagement over time uh, is something we should all aim for. Now, what does that mean, Peter? Right. So we're probably going to have to start to shore up the CRM data we have on clients, the way we collate it and the quality of it, get some real rigor to our teams, understanding that we've got to keep that data up to date because as we're going to fold in insights from a tool like this, then the quality of the data becomes important, you know, and it being kept up to date and it being relevant and timely. So, uh, you know, the sort of sanitation efforts uh, for our data and our client data and our CRMs will play a part um, to how well we can deliver that. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. Uh, and we have spoken in previous episodes. I did mention chat GPT. Now, I've been getting a lot of questions um, from the community about artificial intelligence and, you know, is this the end of the world, all those sort of things. And so I thought rather than talk about a particular app, um, we might just chat a little um, in this Curiosity Corner this week's episode about artificial intelligence. Now, last night I um, watched a John Oliver uh, episode who's a talking head um, from the States, but uh, part comedian, part commentator, um, part rabble rouser. Uh, but one of the sections of what he spoke about last night was on artificial intelligence. And what was interesting about what he was saying is, you know, the current tools we're all looking at, chat GPT, these image creators, those sort of tools that we're seeing and that have, you know, turning up on the news and morning radio and all those sort of things, um, you know, these are narrow tools, you know, meaning they're designed 
to do one thing and it's sort of related tasks and learn how to do that one thing better over time, right? So that's where it's learning and it's development is it's quite narrow. Um, therefore, you know, they don't fall into the T1000 Terminator level sort of AI, it's going to take over the world, right? Because T1000 or, or any of those sort of tools or, or imaginary characters, um, they are an AI designed to do everything and learn everything, right? And so th there is a fundamental difference there. I think we all need to get our head around. Um, that said, <laughs> just because they're narrow, and therefore don't have immediate plans to take over the world doesn't mean there aren't some downsides we sort of need to take into account. Um, and one of them is they only learn from what we feed them as data. Now, in the case of an A, say, and, and John Oliver actually talked about this, and I thought it was really, really interesting. And I mean, while sort of funny too, but really interesting. He said, you know, there's an AI tool that was developed um, in the healthcare space um, to identify skin cancers. You know, what a wonderful thing. And here in Australia, I mean, can you imagine, right? Very quickly identify whether that's a skin cancer. Um, and after going through hundreds and thousands of images that were put through the tool, what was interesting is what it learned that was that rulers are malignant. <laughs> now, the reason it learnt that rulers, as in measuring rulers, are malignant is because most pictures of a skin cancer taken after diagnosis, so that they know that it's malignant, had a ruler next to the, the little um, mole or whatever it is, or the little freckle, um, have a ruler next to them to provide size content. So the tool learnt that the ruler is malignant, right? Now, that's the thing that's interesting about these tools, right? Rubbish in, rubbish out. And I'm not saying that that study was rubbish or anything like that, but we need to be conscious of what we're putting in because these tools are literal, right? And they're going to take things literally. So for the AIs we talk about right now, and, and in a previous episode, we chatted about ChatGPT and other similar, then what they're being fed is the internet, <laughs> you know, and the internet is wonderful and resourceful and has so much wonderful information. It also happens to have all that negative, aggressive, racist, sexist, and otherwise not great content, right? All of that lives there in the internet. And so if there is a bias and of any kind, really, you know, it, it may not be sexist or racist or, or any of those things, but it just could be a bias of any kind in that data or in, in the internet, then the tool being fed that information very quickly incorporates that bias into its outputs. So what that means is, for example, in financial services, it could mean that it's seeing the history, there's a bias towards rapid growth in markets, depending on what time frame you give it. Therefore, it's going to have a bias to assume that there's always going to be growth or, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we can start to see that these, this could go wrong, you know, and the challenge is there's a whole lot we just won't be able to predict either that we never would have thought of. So I guess this is not me being doom and gloom, you know, I'm really not that human being, but um, I guess, you know, as we use these tools, we need to take this into account. What information is going in, therefore, what am I getting out? Um, doesn't mean we don't use them. It just means we do it with our eyes open, you know, our minds open, maybe even our hearts wide open, right, so that we can think about the emotional impact of these things, um, the emotional information going in, and therefore what comes out. Um, so I just thought it was worthwhile covering that. I'd love to to hear your perspective on, on AI and, and, you know, where it's going and, and any thoughts that prompts. Um, so, you know, please uh, reach out or, or post on the Ensemble community because I think this is a conversation we should just keep on having. This is, into, this is not a line in the sand. This is not a moment in time. This will be an evolution that goes on for a very long time. Uh, so let's keep that conversation going because that will elevate all of our understanding of the positives and the risks. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And, you know, I'd really love to hear what session or webinar you would love me to run in the future. 
you know, what how-to session, what hot topic uh, would add the most value? You know, is there a particular section of advice tech that you'd love um, an introductory session on? Uh, what would you like to learn more about? How can I add value to you um, when it comes to advice tech or business transformation efficiencies, um, systems and processes? Uh, if you're keen to have me as a speaker at your dealer group's next event or your association's next event, please don't hesitate to let me know and I will happily reach out to them. Um, uh, you can find all of my details on LinkedIn at forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Stay curious.